welcome to Surrender School. Well, we are covering our steps 10 and 11. Just to let you know, uh, we will then cover 12 next week. And the final week is going to be, be a review of you. So it's all the things that you've learned about yourself. So I'm going to pull together some kind of form that you can basically circle the things that are you. And it kind of gives you a, a, a summary of your type, your instinct, all of that. So anyway, I'm, I haven't finished that yet, but I'm working on it. Okay. So um, this is step, this is chapter 10 and 11 in the book. and also. Uh, steps 10 and 11. So once again, uh, it's a personal journey, not intended to teach you the Enneagram, although uh, a side benefit is that at least you're familiar with the phrase, the, the, the terminology now, I hope. Um, but the goal is to help you recognize the wonderful person that you are so that you can relax into your true self where the God of your understanding resides or at least touch it. Uh, how we do that is we recognize the unseen forces that drive our behaviors. We call them passions, which in program we call defects and fixations, which are the stories that we tell ourselves. So uh, the way we do that is catching ourselves in the act um, as we see our ego causing us to act out our persistent defects. Um, we can gently remind ourselves to return to our true shining self. All right, uh, some things to keep in mind. I'm not an expert on anything. Recovery is a process, not an event. This workshop is a process, not an event. It's like a really long process now if we're doing it again. But I think I think because there's so much information, that's a good thing to do. So uh, when I talked about going into the individual stuff, we got feedback back saying, oh, wait a minute, too soon. So we're going to go through it again. And my hope is that the audience this time are people that have been through it the one time and then it comes back and then it, it all kind of settles in. That's I'm hoping for that anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, We've talked before about self-contempt stopping spiritual growth. It's the reason that we are even doing this session uh, is because if you feel contempt or hatred for yourself, uh, the way that I look at it is my higher power says, you can hate yourself or you can grow spiritually, but you can't do both. You pick, I'll wait. And I'm choosing spiritual growth. Okay, uh, obviously not a lot of homework. We try to keep the homework as little as we can. And then I use my eight examples, which you know that is true. All right, I'm going to stop sharing right now and we are going to open it up for shares. And once again, what I'd like to share on, hold on, go back to gallery mode. What I'd like to share on uh, now is I'd like people to raise their hands. The assignment was, and once again, these seem less complex because they're not split into all the different groups, but it isn't less complex. It's like a big deal, okay? Um, so basically what I'd like is for, people to talk about the lie that they that they live under because of their ego structure and right and basic and once again this is the acknowledge and admit and all of that from step nine but what I'd really like is what have you learned now that you recognize that the lie that you live under and how has that changed your that realization changed your life does that make sense I'd really love to hear that I think uh and once again, this it's almost like that's what program's about, or at least that's what the Enneagram is about, is to recognize the lie we live under. All right, we're going to move on. We got a lot to cover today as well. We are talking about steps 10 and 11. Uh, and 10 is continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So now what's happened when you get to step 10, you have already worked through four through nine, right? So you basically done an inventory, you shared your inventory, you basically were ready to have God remove your defenses, that ego structure, like God, yeah, I want that removed. You're ready to, uh, basically, you're asking him to remove all the shortcomings, all the areas in your life that you've fallen short. You basically took your list and you got with a sponsor or somebody and said, do I know, owe an amends here? And then you paid your amends. So now your side of the street is clean. Your life is clean. It is clear. So now you're going to continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And then step 11 is sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for his will and the power to carry that out. So that's 10 and 11. So what I want to talk about right now is what does that look like? So 10 is actually, and you'll see at the bottom of the screen, that catch ourselves in the act. That is really what 10 is. And some people kind of confuse 10 and 11 a bit. In the big book, 10 is simply, I say something in my case, I say something that is 
rude, incautious, unfair, whatever it is, right? And then I catch myself in the act and I immediately say, I'm sorry, that was selfish. I shouldn't have said that. Immediately, promptly. We promptly, we notice it. And once again, if you if you don't catch yourself in the act, you can't do it promptly. You can't turn right around and apologize. But if you catch yourself in the act, what is expected to live clean, I believe step 10 is live clean. What is expected is that you basically catch yourself and go, oh, okay, didn't mean to do that. Let me apologize for that. Let me change the way I'm going to do it. So the way that I look at that, this is how we grow, by the way. We grow through what we go through. So as I catch myself in the act and I see myself acting, whatever way that is. So twos, right? We talk, people shared about twos. Twos are catching themselves, right? With this concern for others that is actually a concern for self, right? Which is what all of us do this in some form or other, right? The two catches themselves that they're giving love with that hook that then you will love me. They catch themselves in the act of that. It doesn't mean you always owe amends for it, but the catching yourself in the act is a big thing. That That is like the big thing is to see that. And then basically, if you're wrong, you promptly admit it to yourself and to that person, if that makes sense that you need to do that. Okay, so that is actually step 10. Step 11 is where I have a colander here because I think what happens, that end of the day that some people call step 10, looking back on the day, that's actually step 11. Step 10 is just promptly admitted it. Step 11, as part of that seeking, right, through prayer and meditation, part of that seeking is I run my day through a colander at the end of the day. And anything that's sitting in the colander, right, I'm asking my higher power, did I miss anything? Did, because I don't always catch myself in the act. So when it's over, did I miss anything here? Is there anything else that I own amends for? Anything else that I did wrong? Bill is very cautious to say for us not to basically slip into this. I hate myself. I hate myself. That that morose, you know, uh, hatred of self or self because that's not what this is about. What it really is about is to to wash the day through and say, is there anything I know amends for? Make a note to myself, and I'll make an amends tomorrow because we have to live clean. That uh, it, it, that's the only way for us to live in the in the promises of step nine and ten and all the rest, right? Is if we do that at the end of that day. So I I picture it like a colander that basically anything that's still sitting in there means something I haven't dealt with. I need to deal with it. Um, and early on in program, oh my gosh, the colander was filled with the stuff, and now not so much because I really do take step ten seriously, and I really do make sure that I. Uh, if I notice it, I don't always notice it though, right? I don't always notice it. Okay. So uh, why might step 10 and 11 be difficult for my type? So for the ones, they don't necessarily, they, the ones don't recognize that daily imperfect is better than waiting for perfect. And so what will happen is they don't feel comfortable like immediately saying, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Because they're like, oh, I was imperfect. Right. And so they, they get inside their head about the fact that they should have been perfect and like, no, no, daily imperfect, be, be present and be imperfect. It's fine. Right. Because we're not supposed to be perfect. We're not even built to be perfect. Reality means you're not perfect, period. End of story. Um, embrace that. Right. So that's the one. For the two, they sometimes are too busy helping others. So they set aside these reviews. Right. It does. It seems unintuitive to think that they would do that. But it, it, to, it for a two, I think twos, I think you're nodding right now, right? You're so busy helping others and being the good girl, being that, right, all of that, that you set aside that daily practice that we talk about, right? Especially in, in step 11, okay? For the threes, um, part of the problem with threes is that they they will often, they they will do a faulty inventory, which means they have shit left. They didn't do a complete four through nine, they think they did, but they didn't. Um, I put the, in, I, I'm, I was a literature major in college and there's something called an unreliable narrator. And it's like when an unreliable narrator is telling the story, they're telling it through a weird lens that is like, not what? That's not true. And every once in a while, you know, that's just a literary uh, method that some people use when they write books. Um, I think uh, Steinbeck did all the time. So anyway, but the idea here is the the three can be an, unre an unreliable narrator of their own life. And if they didn't do four through nine deeply enough, then that uh, makes it really difficult for them to live in 10, 11, and 12. For the four, for the type four, uh, they may expect or desire more dramatic 
connection than it usually happens. So when there's something that happens immediately and, and I say in step 10, we say, oh, shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, that was selfish. I shouldn't have done that. Um, the fours will crave some kind of either, not, not even necessarily response, but more emotional stuff. I have a friend that that says what happens is her emotions used to be like this. And now that she's living in 10 or 11, 12, they're just like little moguls, right? It's not big, huge swings. And if you're accustomed to big, huge swings, it feels weird. It feels almost numbing to not have that, but you're in, you're on the right track if that's happening with you. That's a good thing. Okay. For the fives, um, they may do all the work and get basically live clean and do all of that, but the changes, they're, they're not sharing the changes with other people. So other people may not notice. Most of the rest of these, your friends and family will notice. They don't know what, but they'll notice, oh, this is different than they used to be, right? Which is cool. But with the fives, you may not. For the six, sixes, it is very difficult for them to easily say that they are sorry. That is that is um, one of their, I guess, one of their defenses is that it's not easy for them to say that they're sorry. Uh, so it requires extra work. So when they say they're sorry, it's like a big deal, right? Um, and some of it is they lack the belief in their ability to grow or change. They don't believe that they are capable of it or that they're, or, and once again, the trusted authority, the closer that they, this is why it's so important for the sixes to, to do step 11, seek God, because until they have a trusted authority, right? And I know authority is probably the wrong word, but I'll use it, right? It, until they have a trusted authority, they don't trust anything or anyone. So if they can basically look at the facet of the higher power that is this trusted authority, they can relax and know that God will help them change. But until they reach that point, they can't. So sixes are stuck until they reach a certain point that they can trust their higher power. I mean, all of us need to trust the higher power, but six, it's a big, big deal. Okay, for seven, it's hard for them to see their wrongs. Uh, that's like part of, for, for 10, because they're like, what, what? You know, they're not, it's not, not obvious to them when they've done something that harmed another person. And then meditation, just slowing down enough to meditate is really difficult. So for, um, so, so basically seeking God, like sitting in, in one place and seeking God. So sometimes for sevens, uh, a walking meditation might be a really good thing for them to do. Okay, for the eight, admitting, um, admitting mistakes makes them feel vulnerable and choosing God's will, that's really hard to practice because, right, because we like to be in charge. And so we're, putting someone else in charge. So that's difficult. And then for the nines, they avoid all conflict. Um, so it's, it's really hard. They can see themselves do something. And then it's really hard because that they don't know what the response is going to be that they're going to get and they avoid conflict. And then it's really easy. So when they're meditating, they're the ones that will check out, they'll fall asleep, or they'll just basically check out. So one of the things I'd like you to journal on, if you'd like a journal topic is what keeps you from living in 10, 11, and 12. And look at these type uh, ideas and see if any of this uh, has to do with what keeps you from living in 10, 11, 12. Okay. So um, I talk, I, uh, those people that know me know that I talk about living in 10, 11, and 12. And the reason today, we're not going to cover 12. We're going to cover 10 and 11 today. Next week, we'll cover 12. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail here in a minute. But I think uh, living in 10, 11, and 12, because now we've cleaned up everything. Our life is clean. We are babies now, right? We are fresh and new. Our true self is there. We are, we are there. Um, 10 is basically live clean. And that means I, right. I'm kind. I'm loving. I'm all the things I'm supposed to be. I catch myself in the act when I'm not, I apologize immediately if I've done something that was unkind or in my, it, usually unkind is my deal. So, right. But whatever it is, I'm, I'm living clean and every day and I'm aware of it. I'm catching myself in the act. Uh, the seek God part, um, so I believe uh, on page 47 of the big book, Bill W. says, God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him. So really and truly, all you have to do is seek and he will find you. That's I, I believe that with all my heart. And then obviously the help others. That, so 10, 11, and 12 is live clean, seek God, help others. Imagine this day. I live clean, I seek God, I help others. And tomorrow, I live clean, I seek God, I help others. And the day after that, I live clean, I seek God, I help others. That's a good way to live. I have free capitalized because this gives you freedom and that makes you happy and joyous. Happy is momentary. Joyous is a feeling and it's good and it's lovely. It's wonderful, but those don't stay. Freedom stays. So when you live like this, you live free and that makes you happy and joyous. At least it does in my case. Okay. 
some helpful de definitions. Um, so this next section we are talking about um, this thing because it's in my way. Hold on a second. Let me move that. Okay. So we're talking about the, the wings today. That was in chapter 10. And then we're talking about balancing across the centers. That was in 11. So the strong wing, you are probably practicing the traits of the strong wing right now, right? So I, I believe, I think eh, that I am an eight with a seven wing. I think actually when I studied this, I'm like, hey, maybe I'm a nine wing anyway, but okay. So you may already be practicing the traits of the strong wing. But the weaker wing, many of the traits of the weaker wing are in your shadow. So later we're going to talk about, okay, what's a strong wing? What does that look like if you have that wing? And then we're going to say, okay, what are the benefits that you get if you can somehow include some of the stuff from the weaker wing that's in your shadow? Okay. Uh, one thing I want you to note is that the wings from, when your wing is from a different triad, remember the, the 891 is a triad, the, the 234 is a triad, the 567 is a triad, right? Um, when your wing is from a different one, it means that that basically informs you. And I want to talk a second about, um, yeah, about I am an eight with a seven wing. And I and I, I guess I probably for sure do because the seven is the head center. And I love this. I love this thing. Oh, I was just sitting here overthinking the joy out of everything. Right? I don't do that too much anymore, but I used to. I drive my husband crazy, right? Because like, so do you think they meant anything by that? Is that, oh my God, just inside my head nonstop, right? And that is not a body type that does that, but that seven wing, right? That basically that wing, um, which is the, the thinking type, right? Shows up, okay. And then the balancing across the centers, each type has one center where they display a deficit. So, um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about, when we get there, I'm gonna talk about what is your what is the triad that you're part of, right? That center that, you're part of, and then what is the one that you probably have a deficit in that you can work on? And then she had some nice suggestions on what to work on. So I'm basically, those are things from the book. So I'm covering those. All right. All right. So when this is your strong way, this is what I'm going to recommend that you do, because I'm going to cover this quickly and it is a lot. So uh, if you recognize yourself, write down which wing you think is you. Because later I'm going to come back and say, okay, the weak wing blessing is this. So if you include the weak wing, then you can do that. Okay. All right. So for the one, the one with a nine wing is called the idealist. They're idealistic, they're logical, they're scholarly, and they can be harshly judgmental. So if you are a one, is that what you're like? Okay. Is that the way you're wired? Okay. And the one with a two wing is called the advocate. And the two softens that one, but they may become overly instructive. So they, they're they the ones that give instructions and directions and write the overly instructive. So if you are one, which of these sound most like you? Okay, all right, so let's go to the two. So the two with a one wing is subtitled the servant and they help because it's the right thing to do, but they also will do things out of a sense of guilt. The two with a three wing is called the hostess. And they and that because they're in the same center, right, which is that heart center, it reinforces helping, but with charm. They're also prone to jealousy. All right. So and what I'm doing is just basically taking the stuff from the book and saying, okay, this is kind of a summary of the stuff she said. So um, take that with whatever. But a two, if you're a two, which of these wings sound truest to you? Okay, for the three, the three with a two wing is called the star. They strategically show their feelings. So they decide when to show their feelings. So actors uh, are very often a three with a two wing. And they, uh, obs usually threes will become obsessed-ish uh, over being admired, but the three with a two wing wants to be liked. They really like to be liked. The three with a four wing is subtitled the professional, and they have greater access to feelings. And that's, shouldn't have two O's in the two, sorry. I, anyway. Sorry about the misspelling. Okay, and they value rational solutions and they do everything that they do with style. All right, so for the three, are you a star? If you're a three, are you a star or a professional? For the four, the four with a three ring is called, wing is called the aristocrat and they're action oriented, they're social, they're ambitious and they're outwardly authentic. They show up as their, their outward authentic self. 
the four with a five wing is called the bohemian bohemian and they are intense and creative they can feel isolated and they're less socially insecure as the than the aristocrat is so they are more socially secure than the aristocrat would be okay all right for the five the five with a four wing is called the iconoclast and they um are in they they live in their internal landscape they are intuitive thinkers they believe that truth is beauty and i, I even say knowledge is beauty so that to them they knowing knowing kind of is the answer okay for the um five with the six wing they're the problem solver they are analytical they're cut off from emotions in their social nerds so they're the ones that you know show up with their own clothes or they you know cut in line or they just they're just not very social people it doesn't mean they're not sociable but they kind of miss the boat a little bit on that and that's the five with the six wing all right the sixes sixes with a five wing are called the defender and they live their life as the little guy against the system but ironically they like to live within set parameters right so they're battling against this system but they like to have parameters set okay for the six with the seven wing, they're called the buddy. They are friendly, humorous, hardworking, and they will vacillate between staying in an unpleasant situation and then going just the opposite and doing something very reckless. So they'll vacillate between those two. They'll stay and stay and stay in, in bad situations and then do something reckless uh, is what the, the six is known for. The seven, the seven with a six wing is called the entertainer. They have keen wit. They uh, are successful, they're outgoing, and they can be very restless. The seven with an eight wing is called the realist, and they work hard and play hard. They're active, intense, may be aggressive, and they love material things. They love to own material things. Okay, the eight, the eight with a seven wing is called the maverick. They, maverick. they are straightforward, adventurous, and they're charismatic leaders. The eight with a nine wing is known as the bear, and they are softer, they're protective, but they're still a force of nature. For the nine, with an eight wing, they're called the comfort seeker. They're good at business, which I thought was interesting. Uh, they have skill in that. They are calm, but they can explode because when they eventually feel whatever it is that has made them angry, whatever, which is that eight wing, my niece <laughs> is this, uh, they can explode. Okay, the nine with the one wing is called the dreamer. They are principled, they're fair, they're philosophical, and they're good mediators because they can see the different, you know, different perspectives. Okay, so what I want you to do now, I'm going to give you a second. Make sure whichever number, whichever type that you are, which wing do you think is probably you? And now I'm going to cover the weak wing benefits that you get from the other wing that's not yours. Okay, all right. So, here are the weak, weak, weak wing benefits that you can enjoy. Okay, so for the one, right, we talked about the idealist or the advocate. If you are the advocate, you can get the mellowness from the other side, right? And, and, and if you are the, if you have the nine wing, you could get compassion from the, the two wing, the weaker wing, okay? All right, so for the two, the servant or the hostess, right? Okay, decide which one you are. And then, and once again, nobody is going to get all of this. It's, there's no way. It should just be what your type is or your what you think your type is. Okay, so the two, the two with the one wing has an inner compass of what is right. That's what it adds to the two, right? Is that they can have the inner, inner compass. So if you are the two wing three, then you can basically borrow from the one and get the inner compass. And for the three, uh, if you are the one, right, the benefit of the, th of the three wing, the hidden three wing, is that you can unhide desires that you didn't even know that you had. And I want to talk for a second about that, because all of this basically says these are in your shadow. If, if, if this is your weaker wing, that is probably in your shadow, and you don't even know that's available to you. So what this is about is getting it so that you say, oh, this is my strong wing, and then the weak wing is what I'm, is is basically, oh, I can get benefit from that. Somebody, it needs to be muted. I don't know who, but I'm getting feedback from somebody. Okay. Um, all right. For the three, for the three, if you have the two wing, uh, basically you can get authenticity from the weaker one. And if you have the four wing, you can feel your feelings more strongly um, 
it, if if the if if you are a three with a four wing, then you can borrow feeling your feelings from the weaker wing. All right. For the four, self-esteem is the hidden benefit of the of the three wing when it's weaker. And emotional intelligence is when your five wing is weaker. Okay. For five, if your four wing is weaker, then basically you can bring in less heaviness to the to your life and to the world yourself, right? And if your um uh, if you, you are the six wing, then you can bring intuition from your weaker four wing. All right. For the six, uh, if your, uh, your strong wing is the seven, then from your weaker wing, you can bring no novel approaches, just kind of an interesting perspective and different novel approaches to things. If your uh, strong wing is the five, then you can add the seven piece, right? Which is hidden to you. Uh, to to play and be spontaneous, right? You can add that. That's a benefit that you could get for that weaker wing. And once again, this might feel a little foreign because this is it, hidden from you, right? That weaker wing is hidden from you, but still available. We talked earlier about what are the wings and you can bring this stuff in, but your weaker wing is hidden. Okay. I know I keep saying that, but this seems like a lot of information. Okay. If you're a seven and you have a six wing, right? Then your weaker wing is the eight wing. And basically what that allows you to do is be very clear on what your values are, right? So a seven who basically is, right, has that, has that six wing can bring in the eight wing and basically understand what they value in life, which is awesome. And if you have the eight wing, which bas basically makes a seven stronger as their main, as their strong wing, then the weak, weak one allows them to focus on joy. They can basically focus on enjoying themselves and do, doing all of that. Okay, for the eight, uh, if you have a seven wing as your strong one, then the nine, the benefit that you can get from that is acceptance. And if you are the nine, right, which is the bear, uh, then you can add hidden from you fun and adventure. So I'm for sure a seven wing because I and I and I have been learning acceptance. Okay, and then for the nine, if you have the eight wing, you can learn to be more spiritual. And if you have the uh, one wing as your strong wing, then you can practice presence as part of your uh, body type with the eight. Okay, that was a lot of information. Hopefully you caught the stuff for you. This is in the book. The idea here is your, your strong wing is the one that you name, right? So I am an eight with a seven wing, but I can get something cool from the one that is not my wing. And I think right now I am going to pause and I am going to stop sharing because I think there was a lot of information here and I am going to allow for questions because this was a lot. The goal of this class is to help you love yourself and say, oh, I'm wired that way. I get it. That's the goal. Yeah. And then also so that you have some nomenclature so that if you decide mm -hmm. to study, there's all kinds of books and cool stuff out there. If you decide to study further, you already have the nomenclature down. That's really what the class is about. This isn't, it truly isn't to teach you the Enneagram, although it probably sounds like that's what I'm trying to do. It's mostly to grow you accustomed to that so that you can do further study. So when we have been through program, right, we aren't the, we aren't that raw, untamed self. We have already introduced ourselves to our true selves. So there's some changes that are going on, which means, yeah, so I guess the, the better answer is that the benefits of the weak wing may already be incorporated in your life. You may have both. You may be using both. I know when I first came to program, this idea of acceptance, I mean, I can remember I was raised the Dylan Thomas, right? Rail against the dying of the light, right? I railed against everything. And now it's like, I know from reading the, the Ellen Berger book, emotional, his emotional sobriety book, it's like, uh, reality doesn't give a shit what I think at all. Reality is reality. It doesn't care about my opinion. So I get to relax about that. It doesn't sound freeing, but it's very freeing for an eight. It's very freeing to go, you know what? Not my circus, not my monkeys. I get to like stand here and just accept that that is the way it is. And so I think an acceptance for me is the weak wing, right? That's why I said I was a little confused because I already have that acceptance. And I'm like, yeah, 
20 years in program. Of course I have that. If I didn't, I'd be like, you know, hitting my head against the wall. So yes, I guess that was a long answer. That, and here's the short one. Yes, you can have both wings. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> we don't know it when we come in, at least in OA, our goal is to, you know, lose weight. The goal in AA is to stop drinking or be nicer or whatever it is, right? We all have this weird view of what it's going to be. And then when, as we're working the steps, God is changing us. That is what happens, right? I'm, I'm doing the work over here and God is doing this work on me. And it's an awesome thing. Thank you. All right. We are ready to move on to the next section. And it's about as heavy as this last one was. So buckle your seatbelts, everybody. Okay. So we just finished that. And now I'm going to go into the next screen. All right. So we all have, we all have all three centers, a body center, a head center, and a heart center. If you think about it, right, where we can, we can feel like sick to our stomachs if something happened, that's the body center. You might have a gut instinct. That's the body center. You have feelings. You have feelings, right? That's the heart center. You're thinking about stuff inside your head. That's the head center. And we all have all of that. We just live in one of them right now we use all three centers because we all have feelings we all have thoughts and we all live in our body right so we have all three but what she says in chapter 11 is there is one area for each of us that there is a deficit in in our type there's a deficit and she gives suggestions on how you might want to practice so that you can enhance the area that you have a deficit the cent the body the center that you have a deficit so what i'm going to do is all right so first of all you see the little guy the little beaver and i want to and i said when i saw it i was like oh, welcome back old friend we haven't seen you for a while so anyway the little beaver is type one everybody knows that so i'm going to use this as an example all the way to the right is the triad that is your um the the triad that center that you basically live in right the one and down at the bottom the eight and nine are the body center that's that body triad right the two, three, and four are the heart. The four, I mean, yeah, four, the five, six, and seven are the head. So as we're going through this, remember to look off to the right to say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's the triad that I live in. That's the triad I'm in. And then where the question mark is, is the, is the center, that triad, or the center, heart, head, body, that you have a problem with, and then the work that's needed. So these are her suggestions, and I think they're pretty good. All right, if you remember, the, the, the type one is the merciful teacher. They live in, they are in the body triad. The area that they have difficulty is in the head, right? In the thinking triad, all right? So her suggestion is to meditate on serenity and become aware of suppressed anger. So the ones will suppress their anger and take it internally. And it turns into self-hatred or it turns into like all kinds of other bad things. You don't want to do that. You want to be aware of your suppressed anger so you can do something with it. And that's a thinking thing, right? Okay. The type two is the intuitive healer. And that's my little dog, Mayhem. They live in the heart center. The twos live in the heart center. Okay. And they also, their deficit is in the head center. And her suggestion to them is to read and meditate on humility. And that doesn't mean like, Oh, like that. It just means to realize kind of your space in the world with other people and with your higher power and so forth. And then take responsibility for your own needs. I have a dear friend that I watch her every day now take responsibility for her own needs, take care of herself. It's just an awesome thing to see. It's awesome to see. All right. Now here's the next one. The inspiring champion is three, right? And that's the peacock. They live also in the heart center. And what I want to point out is the center one, right? So it's one, uh, so it's eight, nine, one, right? The center one of the centers, the middle one of the centers has problems in their own triad. So you notice that the three is the center because it's two, three, four, right? The heart, that's where they have their problems and I, or where they have the deficit. And so the idea for the three is to say, open your heart to explore covered inferiority a sense of inferiority and admit your errors so this is where right right within the heart center is where the the three has their problems in the center that they live in i thought that was fascinating okay 
for the four, the creative alchemist, the four, and I love the, the unicorn, obviously, welcome back. All right. They also live in the heart center and they have problems with the body. Her suggestion to them is to feel what a strong container your body is and stay grounded in that. I thought that was fascinating because sometimes what happens is the, the fours are ungrounded, uh, usually with emotion, right? Okay. For the five, once again, they're the kind wizard. That's the little bear. They are in the head, the thinking center. And their problem is also with the body. And the idea here is to get grounded in your body instead of lost in obsessive thoughts. Those obsessive thoughts that basically take you out of the present and into the future, right? All right. The six is the courageous pathfinder. And this is the little bunny, if you remember the six. They are also head types, but remember they're the center of, they're the middle of the head types. So their problem is in the thinking. And they, her, her recommendation for them is to meditate on faith and courage and to see when you are projecting fear. Because once again, they will project it into the future. I have a friend that says, and I live in the wreckage of my future, right? So that's what six do. They will project that fear of the future or fear of almost anything, okay? And that's basically in their head that they have all this stuff going on and they are part of that head triad, thinking triad. The seven is also part of the thinking triad where they have their problem is in the heart area. And the idea here is to face and release the sadness to truly open your life. Sevens will tell you they are not sad. And what she is saying is you can face the sadness and then release that sadness. And then you can actually live in joy, which I think is just awesome because they are the joyful visionary. I love that. I think that's wonderful. For the eight, the lion hearted protector. Once again, they are part of the body and they're the first of the body, right? Eight, nine, one. They're the first of the body and their uh, def deficit area is the heart. I absolutely live this. And that is open the heart to softer, more vulnerable interactions. People who have known me for a long time, um, Joy is one of those, can see the softening of me, right? I'm, I probably don't seem soft to you guys, but anyway, I, I used to not be <laughs> at all. It was like, Ugh, right? So um, anyway, I'm, um, I, I, I really feel this and I can feel that happening. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. All right. And then for the, oops, sorry. And then for the nine, the gentle mystic. Welcome back, little sloth. Okay. Their area is, once again, they're in the middle of that. They're the middle one. So they're in the body triad and their problem is the body, right? And their, their problem is that staying present in the body to trust their instincts more and to stay present because they will check out. That's what they, that's the way they live their life is they will check out, right? And all of these, we have, we have learned to some degree, but I really like kind of, she's pinpointing, try this, see if you can do that. Okay. One thing I want to talk about that I really like the idea of this is that energy flows where our attention goes. And this is a fact of life. This is the way that life works. Reality works this way. Wherever we are putting our attention is where the energy flows. I choose, and I'm using this for me, I choose to be honest about my thoughts and feelings, even if they're uncomfortable. I spend time reading. I journal a lot. I am in nature whenever I can be. Tougher to do in Vegas than it is other places. I'm from the Midwest, which is nature was all around me then. But anyway, I do that. I have spiritual talk with my friends. That is what I talk about. I don't talk about shit. If I think it's stupid shit, I don't talk about it. Right? I talk about spiritual things. And I spend time with my dogs. What I don't do is worry. What I don't do is basically worry at all about others' op opinions of me because it's none of my business. I don't harbor resentments. I try not to feel fear. And if I do, I journal about it. And I, just kind of any kind of resisting of reality. And I'm being tested right now, which is, I mean, not, I'm not tested like my sister is being tested. She's seriously being tested. But, um, but there's still, right, all this emotional stuff. And I want to flee and I'm not fleeing. And right, so I'm not resisting reality because reality is reality right? And I can live in the world and be here and be present or not. Okay. I do appreciate Joy calls me every day to make sure I'm doing okay, which I just think is a lovely thing. Okay. And once again, living in life in step 10, 11, and 12 is live clean, seek God, help others. And I want to tell you how to do that. To live clean. You make a mistake, you see it, you apologize, and you do better next time. Nothing more than that. No guilt, no shame, no any of that. Make a mistake, which all of us do because we're human see it, right? That's catch ourselves in the act. Go, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Do better next time. 
So earlier, the and I'm sorry, I don't remember who was that. Sharon, I think, was talking about, yeah, I, I apologize all the time, even for things that aren't mine. There's probably some guilt or shame tied in there somewhere, right? So, and if that's the case, no, 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 no. Make a mistake, which we all do. See it. Let's catch ourselves in the act immediately. This is step 10. Apologize and do better next time. That's it. That's all you do for 10. That's how you live clean, right? No guilt, no shame, no any of that. Deal with it right then if you can. Okay. The seek God, consistent daily spiritual practice, whatever that is, or hourly spiritual, seek God, right? He doesn't make it hard for you to seek him. Seek him and he will find you, whatever your God of your understanding is. And then the final one, help others. Be a sponsor, work with others in some way, use your gifts. And next week, we are going to be talking about identifying your gifts and the assignment this week is going to, is about identify what your gifts are. The bottom of my email says the purpose of life is to discover your gift. The work of life is to develop it. And the meaning of life is to give your gift away. So all of us have a gift. If you don't believe you have a gift, then you have some work to do because you absolutely have a gift. You are a gift, right? So meditate or journal. Ask your higher power if you don't already know what is the what is the gift that you bring to the world? You, you, you uniquely, not even usually the type to type, sure, because everything we do is type to type, but you yourself are a gift to the world. How can you express that into the world? All right, so what is left to do, right? Keep calm, you're almost done. And this is for all the British people that we have in here. <laughs> Keep calm and carry on. All right, so what's left to do? Next week, we're gonna be talking about your gifts and also chapter 12, which is a little bit about more about, um, I think, um, anyway, there's other content there. Uh, but next week, the, fi the, the final week, we're going to do a review of you. So next week is step 12, chapter 12, so forth. And then the final week, which is two weeks from now, we're going to do a review of you. And I will have a document that you can print out and we're going to circle some things. And when it's all done, you'll kind of have a portrait of yourself is what the goal is. Okay. So, oh my gosh, so late. Um, so don't forget office hours on Tuesday and Wednesday and also Wednesday afternoon. Um, and Memorize your mantra, do the weekly challenge, read chapter 12 this way. Once again, only your type on the forward and back arrow. That's what it is. And then, um, all right, that is it. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks for recovering with us.